dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, today uh, I'm glad to present a lecture by Dr. Stefan Pian, a scientific researcher and associate professor from uh, the uh, National Museum of Natural History, France, with such interesting as zoological methods reconstitu reconstitute relationship between paleolithic humans and other mammals. Okay, Stefan, please. Uh, yes, hello, thank you. Hello. Pleasure. We will listen to your lecture, please. Hello, everybody. So, uh, this uh, presentation is to uh, um, um, to present and, uh, and and promote the interest of zooarchaeological methods, uh, which both uh, help to to uh, restitute uh, the faunal environment and also uh, to to answer archaeological questions about uh, relationships between humans and uh, from hunter gatherer societies and uh, and what is called uh, animals or especially uh, other mammals. So uh, I am a zoo archaeologist uh, and I worked in the Natural History Museum in, in Paris and uh, we have been uh, working together with uh, Pavlo Shidlovsky for many years, uh, especially uh, uh, with uh, the excavation and study of materials from Mejirich. So uh, this zooarchaeology is a uh, um, and, and methods, um, a method, a topic, which um, is uh, studying uh, zoo zoological uh, remains to answer archaeological questions, to answer archaeological issues. So I will present you the, the different uh, aspects of zooarchaeological studies. Um, uh, which goes from uh, paleontology to through uh, biochronology, paleoecology, taphonomy, which is a, a central topic uh, in, in zooarchaeological studies, and to finish with uh, the, the archaeological questions which can be uh, uh, worked and, the, and, uh, and addressed by uh, zooarchaeology concerning uh, subsistence behaviors. So first, the, the base of zooarchaeology is to determine the material, the faunal material. So this uh, material is, uh, is composed of um, preserved animal remains from archaeological sites, uh, which are in different state of preservation and different state of fossilization. Um, so the... Um, Excuse me, I have to look for my uh, different uh, slide, and it appears that maybe you cannot see all. Or oh, do you see the different slides? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's a question of computer. Uh, so as I. Uh, started to say the material studied in zooarchaeology is composed of what is preserved, and what is preserved is uh, the uh, um, the skeletal part of the skeletal elements, uh, which are mainly the hard parts of uh, organisms. So concerning uh, vertebrates. Uh, it is the uh, in inner skeleton, the skeleton which is uh, inside the bodies of vertebrates. Uh, vertebrates, that is especially bones from, the, from vertebrates, uh, but also the teeth, antlers, which are the, the parts, the frontal part of cervid. That concerns uh, all the vertebrates. Uh, and it concerns also uh, especially mammals, birds, Lys amphibians, rentiers, and the the fishes who which uh, which bear skeleton, the bone skeleton. A fish can also uh, uh, let the another mineral part uh, uh, close to the air, which are called otoliths, but is met, met mostly concerns the sea fish, not so much the. Uh, terrestrial fish which have uh, small such uh, mineral otolith. 
In very exceptional conditions, we can have uh, other hard uh, parts preserved from vertebrates, but um, it's concerning mammals, it's very rare to find uh, uh, such uh, parts like the, the, the cornified part of the bovid horns. What we find is the um, is the bony part, uh, which belongs to the to the skull of bovid. Uh, just to uh, to mention, uh, so invertebrates are found also in the in the fossil material. Uh, com, uh, the part of the skeletal is what is called the, the shells, the shells of uh, especially of mollusks, which um, are found in the, in Paleolithic uh, sites, um, and uh, which can be very important in, uh, in different uh, conditions. Interestrial sites, or so, uh, in terms of uh, paleo environment, and also in terms of uh, of subsistence behaviors, or so, uh, human use and continue to use uh, shells of mollusks. But I will speak of uh, vertebrates, and especially I will speak of mammals, large mammals, uh, which um, um, are the most uh, uh, in, uh, numerous parts of the of the fossil materials from uh, Pleistocene site and Paleolithic archaeological sites, and uh, which concerns the questions uh, I have about uh, human Paleolithic subsistence. So, in paleontology, you have different um, uh, aspect, different methods. Um, uh, the, the base is to compare the morphology of the bone, skeletal material, bones and teeth, which are found in sites, and to uh, compare them with the reference material from collections, from books, or, of course, so, to identify the uh, anatomical elements. We use also um, osteometrical information, we measure bones and teeth to produce biometrical studies. In specific cases, we can also use uh, the morphometrical study, which uh, concerns the study of the shapes of the bone, independently from the size of the bones and teeth. Uh, this uh, kind of method requires um, a large amount of, of bone, so is uh, so far, more applied to um, uh, to to, uh, to recent pre, pre, prehistory, I would say, in, in terms of, uh, of fauna, zooarchaeology, but uh, it can be also used for place to send uh, materials. Uh, it is so far mostly used in uh, in paleoanthropology. So the purpose is to identify the anatomical element, of course, the taxon. The taxon is a large um, word which uh, uh, notably means uh, the, the species. And also individual information concerning the individual age, if it's a juvenile or adult animals, the sex, we can have some information about male or female uh, attribution. And uh, the individual information about the height of the animal, which is taken at shoulder, it's displayed shoulder, and uh, also the body mass, which is also uh, an, an information I will uh, speak of it again later. What we call taxon uh, in, uh, refers to um, a level of, um, of attribution of living beings in uh, a, a scientific nomenclature, which is called taxonomy. So as you see on the, I hope you see on the slide, uh, the species level is one of the numerous level, taxon level, uh, which are used in taxonomy. Uh, you know also the terms of class, for instance, the mammalian, mammal, mammal class. Uh, which, uh, um, which in fact is uh, in a, in a way organized such as uh, uh, matryoshka, this Russian uh, 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 Russian-like uh, 
uh, kind of, of doors in which are one, one in, inside another. And um, so you know so the terms of family and genus and species. And so these different terms refer to different levels of uh, attribution of, uh, of names to the uh, li living beings. This refers to the uh, study of uh, living beings in terms of systematics. It, it means in a, a classification of the living beings according to the phylogenetic relationship. It means uh, uh, the, the relationships, it's in terms of uh, who is ancestor of uh, who, and uh, the research of common ancestors defined what is called a clade, uh, which is a group of organisms uh, derived from one common ancestor. So, in among vertebrates, current vertebrates, five classes are uh, described, which in fact um, refers to, uh, to, to different um, um, positions in terms of phylogeny. So, uh, you can see on this slide that uh, fish, in fact, is a, a class which, which, cons which uh, uh, presents different clades, uh, which comes from, uh, in fact, uh, with what we, different uh, ancestors. So it's, it is called polyphyletic class. At contrary, mammals are uh, well defined in terms of uh, phylogenetic systematic as a, a monophyletic class with one common ancestors, which defines this class, uh, class of mammals. The, this uh, and type of analyse is, uh, uh, which is done by biologists, uh, is by systema systematists, are, uh, is used by paleontologists uh, to um, to, to, uh, to, to, place, to, to place in the frame of the evolution of living beings. And concerning mammals, uh, their evolution is known uh, since uh, about 65 million years, uh, since uh, the, the, the Cenozoic and is continuing uh, now through the, 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 the current era, which is called Quaternary and which uh, is uh, mostly composed of the Pleistocene, uh, Pleistocene part. And so most uh, 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 orders of, uh, of manners are uh, present from uh, the, 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 the early uh, Pleistocene and uh, going, continuing uh, until, uh, until now, and, uh, for uh, continuing every day to evolve. And uh, among this um, mammal evolution, we, uh, we, there is uh, uh, di different, uh, um, di different community dif of, uh, of mammals which are known across uh, the place to say. Now. And I will just uh, give um, um, an illustration of the uh, upper place to say, uh, faunal assembly, faunal, uh, uh, fauna, upper place and fauna, which refers to an ecosystem which has appeared, which is called Mammostepa, and which has been known during upper Pleistocene all over the northern hemisphere and notably in, in Europe. So, as the, the name refers, it's, uh, it integrates the famous woolly mammoths. Uh, uh, Mammutus primigenius, it's the uh, la last example of ele family Elephantidae, Elephantidae from uh, Upper Pleistocene, uh, last fossil Elephantid. Uh, it uh, uh, also presents uh, other large herbivores such as uh, the woolly rhino, uh, which is a uh, which skeleton is uh, um, uh, found in association with uh, woolly mammoths uh, across the mammoth uh, steppe. Among herbivores, equids are well represented, very well represented by uh, two, two types, two main types, the cabaline type, which is uh, the, the current 
horse and the Hadrian time types, which uh, is uh, close to the current Hemion from uh, Asia. And uh, these two types of horses were present in, uh, in Europe in uh, Upper Pleistocene. The herbivores belonging to the uh, Reminentia are very numerous in Upper Pleistocene, and uh, notably the family of the bovid, which is presented in the slide, represented by the uh, step bison. Uh, but there were also uh, other bovid uh, present in the in the mammoth step, uh, such as the saiga antelope, uh, which is now uh, known in Central Asia. Servils bearing uh, antlers and not horns such as bovids uh, have been known uh, across uh, up, across place to sand and notably other place to sand uh, is known as uh, the reindeer and uh, other uh, deers uh, or cervids which disappear the red deers and uh, largest larger deers which uh, uh, such as megaceros or elk. Besides herbivores, carnivores were also uh, very present in the mammoth steppe and uh, associating uh, large size carnivores such as the cave bear, or, uh, or the cave hyena, or the cave lion, uh, which uh, disappeared, and other uh, large uh, carnivores which are still uh, uh, present, such as the brown bear or large canids such as uh, wolf and other small uh, carnivores, uh, different fox, foxes and, uh, and smaller carnivores uh, of the mustelids such as wolverine were present in the mammoth step. What is interesting is in, uh, in it's a late upper Pleistocene, uh, uh, the appearance of the oldest domesticated uh, a mammal by, uh, by human, uh, which is a dog. Paleolithic dog uh, have been uh, known uh, since at least uh, the late upper uh, Paleolithic, uh, more precisely the Magdalenian or Epigravetian uh, cultural context uh, is through uh, Europe, from uh, East to Western Europe. And uh, there are very debates, uh, large debates uh, now about the, an earlier domestication of paludic dog, which present uh, good evidence uh, according to, to the, the part of the authors during Gravetian times in uh, uh, Central Europe, uh, or even uh, during origination in, uh, in Western Europe. So that's a large uh, uh, debate about the uh, early presence of paleolithic dog, which is, uh, at any way, the oldest uh, domesticated mammal. Small size mammal must be also considered, uh, especially in, uh, in terms of environment, and also in terms of subsistence behaviors, such as uh, the hares, uh, which are presented on this slide, uh, and in some uh, uh, in, in different uh, sites also, uh, uh, large, large rodents uh, have been uh, also used uh, by, uh, by humans in their subsistence uh, habits. So, this basic determination of animals and their, body and their skeletal remains is, uh, is useful also to precise the chronological position of the assemblages, of the faunal assemblages, and also of the sites where the funeral assemblages come. So that's what is called biochronological study, which refers to a stratigraphic uh, principle, two stratigraphic principles, some sort of uh, well known and used by geologists uh, and paleontologists. It's that in one layer, uh, uh, all the objects have the same age. And uh, the superposition of layers refers to a superposition of, of ages. And so this um, very simple principles of stratigraphy applied to a, um, a 
paleobiological material to fossil material help to use this fossil distribution among the different layers to give uh, a biochronological information of the different layers. So just an example, which is, has been uh, developed by uh, uh, French researchers, Claude Guérin. He, uh, he could describe um, amongst um, the uh, evolution of uh, mammals uh, in uh, evolution of uh, large mammals uh, in the Pleistocene. Uh, different zones, biozones, and uh, which are um, characterized by associations of uh, of mammals. And so, for instance, uh, what is called upper Pleistocene, what is described as upper Pleistocene in uh, ge geochronology, uh, refers to two different biozones of two different associations of mammals in uh, in, in Europe. So uh, the determination of mammals helps to uh, give an information in terms of, uh, of chronological position. What is uh, one topic, uh, what's in one of the interesting topics is uh, in, among the evolution of, uh, of mammals, the, the, the end of uh, upper, of upper, upper Pleistocene, which is characterized by an, an extinction um, uh, of large size terrestrial mammals, which are shown on this slide, the woolly mammals, uh, woolly rhino, megaceros, step bison, and others disappeared at the end of Upper Pleistocene. Uh, in different terms, uh, considering the continent, it is more uh, pronounced in America and Australia than in Eurasia or Africa. And so far, it is associated with the major climatic change, which changes, which occurred at the transition from uh, Pleistocene to, to Holocene about 12,000 years ago. But it uh, also uh, raises questions about local uh, role of uh, human activities, uh, especially uh, hunting uh, activities, which could have been uh, um, a, 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 another uh, parameter in the extension, in the local extension of uh, local populations, fragile population, vulnerable population of, of this large mammal. So, um, these questions of uh, evolution and especially extinction of large mammal uh, is also related to archaeological uh, questions. The, the identification of animal remains helps uh, also to restitute the paleoecological context. That means uh, uh, former landscapes and climates uh, in, in which uh, human populations lived. And uh, I will present just a, a, a few uh, methods uh, using the large mammal uh, data to uh, restitute paleoecological information. Uh, first, one method, which is called the Xenogram method, uh, which was uh, uh, first developed by ecologists, then applied to uh, uh, place to same time by uh, paleontologists is based on the body mass distribution among uh, manners, uh, which is known to be related to uh, the degree of, uh, of humidity in the, of the climate and uh, uh, also the, the condition of the development of vegetation in an environment. So, uh second uh, uh, base of this method is that the body mass, which is known, uh, what well, can be known from uh, um, past species, uh, because it is correlated with uh, the uh, different uh, skeletal elements, and notably with a very well preserved element, which uh, are the, the teeth and uh, especially um, a mathematic correlation has been established between the first lower molar, 
so which is the most common tooth found in uh, in uh, found fossil fauna. So the correlation has been found between the uh, dimension, and especially the surface of the mastication mastication surface, and correlated with the body mass. So just with one uh, tooth of uh, fossil um, species or past species, you can uh, calculate the body mass. And so you can uh, attribute, as it is presented on, on this slide, uh, you, have, uh, you can have different uh, um, distribution of the body mass in a, a mammal community. If the, uh, if the climate is, is drier, you will have less large size uh, and mammals. So the, um, the, the, the number of large size species will be uh, reduced. And if you, you are in um, an open environment, it means with uh, grass and uh, very few uh, trees, more grass than trees, you will have a few middle sized species. So this distribution of body mass of mammals in one uh, ecosystem uh, helps you to uh, determine the uh, level of uh, humidity and vegetation cover in a past environment. Mm -hmm. Another method uh, use the body mass uh, uh, and three other parameters. It is called the ecological diagram. And uh, so, uh, a Besides the body mass distribution, it used the taxonomic distribution, the dietary uh, adaptation distribution, so between the animals which eat insects, fruits, uh, more leaves, uh, hard, um, hard vegetation, uh, meat eaters and uh, which are uh, omnivorous and it uses a fourth parameter which is a locomotion so which uh, uh, differs from the uh, and, uh, mammals uh, used to uh, to move in a forested environment in a open environment in a, in a, in, a, in a tree and uh, trees arboreal species uh, which uh, use waters, or uh, which can even fly, such uh, as uh, different flying mammals exist, or even um, the, the animals which can uh, move be, be below the, the, the ground, underground. So the use of these four parameters, um, which I have no, no time to, to, to uh, present more detail now, can help to uh, uh, restitute. So, so if the paleo-environment, paleo-vegetation paleo was more uh, composed of grass or open environment, or more com composed of trees, so arboreal environment. Other methods, uh, for instance, use um, the degree of, uh, of wear of the tooth. So it's uh, uh, on this uh, slide, you can see different stages of uh, wear of teeth, of herbivores teeth, uh, fragments, uh, uh, from this stage zero to this stage six. Uh, which, uh, so this is a, a tooth, uh, a slide of tooth, in fact. And uh, this um, uh, morphology is uh, different uh, according to the type of, um, of uh, vegetation they eat. And it's different between two uh, very opposite categories, the leaf eaters, what are called browsers, and the grass eaters, which are called grazers. So, in fact, the grazers uh, have more worn teeth, uh, which is due to the proportion of grass, which are more destructive, in fact, to the to the teeth, which are which wear uh, most, which which wear more the teeth than the, the, the leave or softer uh, uh, vegetation food. So, this method had to um, uh, on, on, on fossil uh, species, on teeth, uh, can uh, help to distinguish uh, the proportion of uh, grass uh, eaten 
and uh, it gives information of the global global diet along the last years or, or months of uh, animals. And so the proportion of uh, grass eaters helps to determine the proportion of grass in the environment of a mammal community. Another wear method is the micro wear, which uh, this time refers to the um, um, study of micro traces in the in the uh, very small scale I, as you can see on the, the, on the slide on the picture so the scale is 0 0.1 millimeter so using of course uh, microscopes micro traces are composed of scratches and uh, kind of pits called punctuations which are uh, quantified which are counted uh, described and uh, compared with current uh, mammals. It can, so it has been used to uh, uh, apply to herbivores, but it can also be applied to uh, all mammals. And uh, among the ungulate herbivores, it can help to distinguish the proportion of browsers so grass uh, leaves, leaf eaters, grazers, grass eaters, fruit eaters, and also mixed feeders in uh, a past community of mammals. And uh, it gives, in fact, these this, uh, micro traces are related to the last diet, the final diet of the, of the animals before their, their death. Uh, so it gives a kind of uh, of, uh, of photography of, uh, the, um, of, the, of the last diet of animals at, at death. So this method combined with, uh, with, uh, my, with mesoware, the previous I told of, and other, uh, other methods helps to restitute the proportion of, uh, of, um, of diets among herbivores and also the kind of vegetation in the environment of the past mammals. Another method which has been uh, very developed uh, is using uh, the uh, isotopic uh, chemistry recorded in uh, skeletal elements. So it has been first used, uh, described in, uh, in, by, in, by, by biologists, biochemists, biochemist, yes. And it has been applied to uh, fossil materials. Mm -hmm. Uh, studying those um, stable isotopic uh, forms of uh, chemical elements such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, and also uh, uh, different uh, other uh, elements such as strontium, uh, which can be uh, analyzed in the uh, fossil materials, in bones and, and teeth, but also in shells for uh, invertebrates. And uh, the base of this uh, study, isotopic studies, uh, is that the proportion between isotopic forms of ele chemical elements change during a biochemical reaction, and uh, notably during digest digest digestion. So it means that in uh, the skeleton of mammals, in our skeleton, but every uh, as mammal skeleton, we record what we eat in terms of uh, isotopic uh, forms of chemical elements. And uh, so, based on this, um, um, based on this uh, information, um, which uh, more precisely is called the isotopic fractionations, fractionation of isotopes. Uh, uh, we can identify in the skeleton uh, the isotopic nature of, uh, of the diet. So this is a large topic, but uh, you have to know that it's uh, uh, used in, in different, uh, uh, in different, um, for different issues, and notably concerning the, the, the manners. It helps to identify the, the eaten proteins. Uh, so in this slide, you can 
uh, read uh, in French, but it uh, looks uh, like uh, English terms. That's uh, 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 the isotopes of carbons, which are on the uh, horizontal uh, uh, level, and the uh, uh, isotopes of nitrogen, which are on the vertical levels, uh, have different values between the herbivores and the carnivores. And the uh, eaters of malaco fauna and the fish eaters, ichthyo fauna, and also the marine mammals. So you have different isotopic uh, values in the skeleton, in the bones, in the teeth, which refers to the, the diet of the animals. And this uh, isotope study uh, so helps to determine the paleo diets and through these paleodiets to determine the, uh, the vegetation and, the, also, the, um, and also uh, the relations between prey and predators, who, uh, which animals could uh, eat, uh, which carnivores could eat uh, herbivores in one ecosystem. So it's a very uh, in interesting method, which uh, is uh, more and more used to work on the uh, uh, diet uh, questions and environmental issues. I'm turning to taphonomy, which is central in uh, zooarchaeology and now in all archaeological uh, study, which uh, has been described by Yifremov as a science of the laws of embedding as soon as, uh, as early as the uh, 1940s. And uh, it has been, uh, as a paleontologist, uh, Yefremov uh, uh, defined this, uh, this, uh, this topic, so this, uh, this discipline, the science. And uh, it has been uh, very used by zooarchaeologists uh, to uh, help to uh, describe and to find the origin and the history of faunal assemblages uh, from uh, what we what we study, which is uh, only a, a part of uh, what has been uh, preserved in, in the soil, and uh, if we we try to go back in as far as we can to reconstitute uh, the, the animal population which was buried uh, from the, the dead animals and. In terms of paleoecology, we try to reconstitute uh, what uh, represents these dead animals uh, in, the, in the past living population, animal population. So it's a really a detective story to, um, to study, taphonomically study the, the bone uh, remains, to go uh, back to uh, uh, what happens to this uh, uh, faunal remains from the living animals to the, the samples we study. So we um, consider different large categories of uh, taphonomic agents related to climate and soil, edaphic means soil, ground if you prefer, um, and biological agents uh, taking into consideration the human uh, modifications, which are particularly interesting for archaeologists. So these different agents produce um, different processes uh, in terms of physical and chemical aspects, leading to modifications uh, of, of, of uh, first to setting of animal uh, accumulation of bone assemblages and modification of the, of the bone remains. So this modification, these agents, taphonomic agents, can uh, work, um, have an action at the origin to produce bone assemblages and also to modify the assemblages. So two chronological uh, aspects, in fact, at the origin and during the history of uh, the, the bone assemblages. Uh, first, in the climatic and soil agents are considered uh, together here because they are very uh, related. Uh, so, in in, uh, in in brief, 
I would like to, uh, of course, point that uh, the conditions are different. Uh, the exposure to climate uh, are different between open air sites and rock shelters or uh, caves sites. The uh, in terms of of climate and in terms of soil also. The sediments also have a very important influence. We know the difference between the uh, a sandy sediment, uh, which is very uh, destructive to, uh, to bone material, and um, um, a sediment which is fine, which, has a, 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 which is neutral in terms of chemics, chemic, uh, chemistry, which is good to, uh, to, to, which is better for preservation of bones. And different aspects also due to the uh, uh, d different layers which accumulate the, bo the bones and can uh, compact. It means press the, the bones and, and, and modify them. In terms of climate, uh, conditions are very different between cold, temperate, and hot uh, climatic zones, and also between seasons. Uh, in the upper place to send, we uh, we, we often uh, take into consideration the hot season and the, and, the, and the cold season, which had different influences on the on the bone taphonomy. Climatic uh, processes are uh, being mostly due to uh, two parameters: temperature and uh, uh, quantity of rain, snow uh, falling. And uh, what is uh, in I will focus more on the processes which are uh, uh, related to both climate and, and soil, climatoidaphic processes. First, the soil effluxion, which is important in the cold conditions of, um, of mammoth steppe environments, uh, which uh, describes the uh, movement of soil uh, full of water at the, 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 the beginning of the hot season, which moves the, the soil with uh, the content, archaeological and fauna content. And what is called weathering. Weathering is, um, has been described by um, uh, American uh, taphonomist uh, Berenz Meyer, and she uh, described um, the different uh, stages of uh, bone surface modification uh, during the, ex the time of, uh, uh, of exposure in open air. It means she observed year after year how bones in open air uh, were, were modified by climatic and, and soil uh, agents. And so she observed that there is a, a really a, a, a different dis, distinct stages from appearing of cracking, which are on this, uh, uh, on this, uh, on this slide, on the second uh, uh, bone, uh, uh, which is a uh, uh, bone in print, uh, which is presented here. Then uh, flaking, it means uh, a, a part of, of bone which is going out of the bone surface and more and more uh, 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 thick uh, part of bone which is going out and then until splitting, which is the uh, uh, destruction of bones in different flakes. And so in fact, this uh, observation and description of weathering stages help to, uh, this, to, uh, to determine the time of exposure of bones to the open air before the final barrier. So it gives a, a, a clue to uh, um, to, to describe, to know the, the time uh, when the bone stays in open air before being buried. Water is a very important uh, climate agent in terms of climate and soil uh, modification, personomic uh, agent of modification. And this is uh, an illustration of uh, the, the chemical abrasion due to water on bone surface. So this, uh, pits, these different pits on these bones on this slide are due to uh, water, which uh, fall on the bones 
uh, and uh, the, the, the reddish color is due to another water action, this time it during when the bones were uh, buried in the soil and um, in, in, a, in a humid, humi uh, wet soil, a, a soil which contains enough humidity. Another water action, which is, uh, which is well known, is the uh, mechanical abrasion uh, uh, giving this rounded uh, aspect of, of bones, such as pebble, bone pebble, uh, with, uh, it's due to the water transport of bones. And also here we have this uh, uh, blackish colors, which is due to a, 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 a mineralization in a, in a wet, uh, a wet uh, sedimentary uh, en uh, environment after burying. Biological agents are numerous also to modify the bone material. Uh, from the microorganism to the, the, the large size uh, uh, vertebrates. Uh, for instance, the plant roots are known to let this uh, very uh, uh, well uh, uh, grooves, uh, curly grooves at the surface of, of, of bones. Uh, which are indicative of the, the, the stain of bones in this uh, uh, root uh, uh, root layer below the, the ground surface. So it's, it gives information on the chronology or so of burying of bones. Uh, also, herbivores are known to modify the bones in different terms. They, uh, when they are in a in group of, of herbivores, they can uh, 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 trample the bones and, uh, and, and break them and uh, disperse them. And also, uh, different herbivores uh, also uh, know with the, the, with the mouse and this, the bones. And this is an example on this slide of red deer. Uh, antler, which has been uh, known, eaten by other red deer, which produce this rounded uh, modification. So uh, we must be careful as zooarchaeologists not to uh, attribute to uh, humans uh, this rounding of bones, which in this case, in this case, is due to, uh, to red deer, uh, red deer eating. Uh, eating for uh, mineral uh, resources. Rodents are known to produce uh, modifications on bones, such as this, um, uh, th these marks due to their incisors. So it, it is, it is uh, found by pairs of uh, grooves, uh, small grooves for small rodents, large uh, grooves for large rodents. And this is an example on the uh, reindeer, uh, reindeer antlers, Rangifer uh, Tarandus uh, antlers, which is on this slide. Large rodents can produce also a larger modification, and you can see the, the scale. It's almost one centimeter large uh, grooves due to a uh, large rodent modifications. Uh, this is a porcupine, porcupine uh, action in, on this material, which is, maybe some have found it, which is a, a fragment of um, elephant tusk. Yes, it's an elephant tusk uh, fragment, uh, so it's a uh, recent material in, in uh, Africa, which uh, we, we can see as a this, this tusk, which has been known. So you can, it gives an illustration of how uh, porcupines can, uh, uh, and large rodents can modify seriously the bone material. Carnivores actions are very studied because uh, large carnivores and small carnivores occupied, uh, often occupied uh, the same uh, caves as uh, Paleolithic humans. Um, and so we are often, uh, we, we often find sites where you have uh, both uh, presence of carnivores and humans. 
not at the same times, but in the same sites at different times. And so it's important to make the difference between carnivores and human action. So this uh, classical modification on the slides due to uh, canid, uh, so the family of wolf and uh, and uh, and dog and uh, and fox, uh, with these holes, with this rounding of uh, of um, of frag fragmented fragmentation, breakage of bones, rounding of bones, and this even. Uh, uh, fork-like uh, structures of uh, uh, of uh, uh, long bone ends, and uh, very serious modifications. So by by uh, Arnon also by uh, hyena, uh, which um, have led in in, in case uh, such modified bones due to the uh, injection of bone and regurgitation. So these bones, which are on the side, have been eaten by, by Haina and through <laughs> back, I would say, regurgitated, uh, and showing all the modification done in the stomach by stomach acid on the surface. So uh, very uh, on flakes, uh, which very which different kind of uh, of modification, but. Mostly, we can see these holes due to uh, dissolution by uh, gastric, by stomach uh, gastric acids, and uh, sometimes large, uh, quite large bones such as this uh, horse phalanx, horse phalanx, which has been regurgitated by hyena. Now let's go to to humans, which uh, have um, very important uh, modification on bones, and and um, we know. Uh, among hunter-gatherer, uh, that uh, diff different uh, activities of processing of uh, of animals of mammals uh, let uh, different marks uh, from uh, the uh, taken of uh, of viscera of uh, internal uh, organs, the skinning, the use of the skin and force. The different uh, way of uh, cutting the, the carcass in different parts and different, about different skeletal parts, and the use of flesh, of course, the, the meat, and the use of meat, and also the use of uh, the end of muscles, tendons, and the bone, uh, and from the bones, the extraction of marrow and the extraction of grease from the end of bone. So, very different uh, resources. Uh, used have been used from uh, by uh, humans from uh, large mammals, uh, and uh, the observation of uh, processing in by uh, in hunter gatherer societies are tested to uh, uh, to understand what we are, what we see in, uh, in in Paleolithic society uh, fossil remains, and uh, so the interpretation of uh, of marks taphonomic marks on bones have been now uh, used and uh, interpreted in terms of butchery marks. So here we have uh, very, uh, um, uh, I would say, explicit uh, cut marks uh, on bones. One on the right is due to the skinning on, on reindeer phalanx, and on the left of uh, this articulation of the, the, the end of the, of the hand of the, of the reindeer. And also uh, other butchery marks uh, are related to the uh, breakage, uh, which uh, is here illustrated as a very uh, uh, typical human-made uh, breaking of bones with this on, on fresh uh, uh, pattern, fresh break pattern of bones, and uh, the place of the impact which uh, produces uh, this, uh, this breaking. The bones are, and teeth are, have been also used to uh, to to make fire or to, uh, um, to to contribute to fires. So that is called bone fuels, which are, have been known for, for uh, quite good time in the Paleolithic. 
and also uh, the bone marks uh, are also uh, found in relation to the use of um, skeletal materials for non-dietary use, for technical use, for uh, to uh, as blank for different uh, artifacts, uh, uh, tools, or different uh, ornaments or. Uh, or or mobile art in the upper Paleolithic. An example of containers uh, used uh, from uh, uh, pelvis bones from reindeer to, to put uh, ochre. And I am turning with all this taphonomic uh, human marks to uh, the interest for zoo, for archaeological questions concerning uh, the, the subsistence period. So we uh, use this term subsistence behaviors uh, uh, in a large meaning, uh, considering the modalities of exploitation of uh, natural resources from animals uh, to, uh, to, for the existence of the human individuals or, or groups. So, uh, to, to, um, to put in light the subsistence behaviors, uh, it depends on humans, it depends on the games, of course, and then environment. So, uh, different patterns, different parameters, which uh, uh, must be studied to identify the subsistence behaviors. Hunter-gatherers are known to uh, procure animal resources by hunting, but also by scavenging and gathering of material, especially for large-sized uh, mammals, such as elephant or uh, rhino. For instance, animal resources are processed uh, for food, but also for uh, other purposes, uh, for non dietary purposes. And that's important to consider together as the animal resources, as a global uh, resources for hunter gatherers. Uh, the study of um, of subsistence behaviors um, is uh, important also to contribute to the uh, to, to restitute main innovation in the human evolution, and I give you here such a few examples of uh, of uh, major innovation related to subsistence behaviors. Uh, first, the, the oldest evidence of butchery, which uh, which uh, are more than three million years old known in East Africa and uh, raised question about uh, which hominines produce this uh, first butchery uh, uh, because uh, homo in, in this, uh, in, this in, uh, in, in sites were, uh, were not uh, present and so other hominines uh, are, uh, are concerned by this first uh, producing of, of butchery. Uh, in, in, the, in the use of fire control, of course, is important uh, considering the, uh, the transformation, the heating of, uh, and the cooking of food and especially of meat uh, through the human evolution. And the uh, evidence of hunting of large mammals, which so far uh, is at least uh, 350,000 years old known uh, in Africa and in, in Europe. So um, the, the, the eating of meat eating, hunting, are very uh, central uh, activities which are, are, are questioning uh, our uh, modern, uh, modern life. And so it's interesting to, to address these issues to past uh, human societies to uh, to think uh, how, uh, how human evolution uh, occurs with uh, this uh, influence of these uh, activities. In terms of uh, skeletal materials, the use, as I told, fauna remains not only for food, but it's also for uh, uh, non-dietary purposes. And we know uh, the use of bone tools as soon as, uh, as early as lower Pleistocene in, uh, in, South, uh, in South Africa. Here's an example from South Africa, from Schwarzkrantz. 
and um, a, f a first development is known uh, during a uh, Middle Stone Age, an African Middle Stone Age, and uh, Middle Paleolithic in, uh, in Europe, uh, with the use of tools, bone as tool, and also the use of teeth for personal ornaments, which are known in uh, Neanderthal sites. The use of, of bones also in dwelling structures is uh, is very well developed in Upper Paleolithic. Uh, here's an example of uh, Mezin in Ukraine, but you have uh, other examples, of course, in Mezirich, also in Ukraine, Dokranichivka, and uh, in the valley of the Don, also in, uh, uh, in the sites of Kastionki in, uh, in the Don Valley in Russia. So many examples, but also you have a middle example, middle Paleolithic examples in Morodova in, in Ukraine, which uh, uh, shows the very early use of uh, bones as building materials. Uh, after, I would say the very uh, large diversity of usage of bones in uh, for bone in, in, as blank for bone industry is known during Upper Paleolithic. And uh, here on the slide is just a few examples, the diversity, large diversity of of uh, technology of uh, producing uh, these different tools, different uh, hunting weapons through uh, using bone, cervid antler, and mammoth uh, ivory in upper Paleolithic uh, societies. And also for uh, personal ornaments and portable art, mobiliary art, using uh, uh, again teeth, especially incisors and canines. So the, uh, front teeth of mammals, uh, uh, using the very specific uh, mammoth uh, ivory, uh, mammoth tusks, ivory in so uh, diverse usage of, uh, of, uh, of figurines, uh, uh, of uh, animal and, fem and, uh, and human, especially female figurines, and also, uh, and also beads, which uh, as illustrated in the slide, and also bone has been used uh, in, during a paleolithic, especially the, uh, among bones, the ribs of herbivores, uh, which are very numerous, uh, or the scapula of, rain of, uh, of um, cervids, a shranger, which uh, uh, have this flat uh, uh, technical possibility and uh, interesting example of horse usage, which are quite uh, known, is the use of the horse tilohiri. This is bone, which is uh, in the, in the in here in these parts, uh, which is difficult to obtain. So, uh, and there is a pair of such tilohiri, so two tilohiri per horse, and um, it's interesting that how the Paleolithic people looked for, especially for these bones, difficult to, 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 uh, to, to, to take, uh, to produce this, uh, this head uh, figurines. Servid and claws also was used in, uh, for this uh, purpose. So I will finish uh, uh, this, um, this, uh, this, this presentation to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to say that uh, the, the study of, of uh, the use of uh, animal resources uh, in, in global diet and non-diet help to determine uh, the, the domestic activities of uh, Paleolithic uh, peoples uh, and to describe the function of the site uh, between campsite, uh, different duration and activities on, on Paleolithic sites. And to compare also in one territory or between territories how peoples moved and used and people use uh, the, the, uh, the natural resources and uh, also exchange uh, materials, uh, notably uh, ornaments between uh, between uh, between groups, um, and how they, they move in these territories, uh, considering climate and also uh, cultural. Uh, uh, motivation. So I will finish on the slides uh, a little late, so maybe there is a, a little question, time for questions. Thank you very much.
Stefan, thank you yes. very much for your for your interesting lecture. And uh, modern archaeological research cannot do nothing without the zooarchaeological approach and without the presence of zooarchaeologists uh, uh, on the site <laughs> while excavation. Does anybody have a question to our lecturer? I saw Tim Tim Verle. Please raise the hand or not? Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> Just clapping. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Stefan. Yes. No. It's late. What uh, we have direct marks about the seasonality. What direct marks can be used for the identification of season uh, of the site or, or of the layer? Uh, classically, uh, with the fauna, we um, we can use the the individual age of uh, of animals. Uh, because um, uh, if we find um, very uh, young individuals, uh, we can uh, find more precisely the, their age in terms of months. And so, uh, considering that uh, the, the most favorable time for, a, for, for birth, for a... Do you understand what I mean? Birth time uh, of uh, animals in Upper Pleistocene in Mammostep fauna was the, the early hot season, the spring, early summer. So with this, um, uh, with this, uh, how could I say this um, consideration, we can uh, uh, determine with ju very juvenile individuals the uh, season of uh, of death of animals and so we can consider the if it is a uh, hunted animal the season of hunting and so the season of settlement by uh, by humans but um so uh so we need this uh, this material which is not always uh, present to have a juvenile uh, juvenile uh, individuals, very juvenile individuals, because if we have only adults, uh, we, we don't have so precise information on their individual age. We can say they have a few years, or we have a, an approximation in terms of years, but uh, we need juvenile individuals, very juvenile individuals to, to have an, uh, an individual age information to uh, estimate the season of hunting and settlement. Uh, thank you, but in this case we have to be sure that uh, this uh, object uh, uh, appeared at the site as a game, uh, not, 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 not be taken by the humans from around bones. Right. Uh, that, that's why it depends on the kind of material which is fine, if we, which is found. If we find just one teeth, uh, it can have been, as you say, can have been brought into the site by humans from different times, different uh, places. So there is no uh, seasonal information, but another information, but not about the season. So it depends if we have um, um, evidence of uh, of hunting and and. Uh, of this of the, the of the species so if we have other remains uh, showing that uh, carcasses was were uh, transported or partly transported to the site and so we, we have first to 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 find evidence of uh, of hunting of the animals for for this yes yes that's uh, that's right <laughs> okay thank you maybe somebody have a questions too or maybe uh, for discussion. Maybe not. <laughs> but Stefan, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, for your participation and for your lecture. Uh, later, we will give you uh, the original recording.
and uh, everybody can will will uh, have a possibility to find uh, on a YouTube channel uh, the recordings of all lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you for organization. <laughs> okay.